Welcome to Let's Talk Near Death, the podcast show that talks about life, death, and experiences somewhere in between. I'm Kirsty Salisbury, the host of the show, and I hope you'll join me as I chat to everyday people with not-so-everyday experiences. You may also wish to join the conversation over in the Let's Talk Near Death online community, which is found at www.letstalknearedeath.com. Membership is free, or you're welcome to upgrade to join the live VIP events, to gain early access to episodes, or to receive extra VIP bonus material. Your support helps me to continue to get episodes out and to help grow the conversation around these types of experiences. But before then, let's talk near death. And then I had dreams of a deceased woman coming to me. In my physical body, my heart rate basically stopped, my breathing went to zero, and my blood pressure just tanked completely. It felt real. I mean, it felt real. It felt more real than here. Here's a dead guy from 50 years ago, comes back and tells you something. Is this heaven? Is this where we go when we die? Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. We are in season 11 talking about near death experiences, after death communication, and spirit communication. My guest today is Nancy Rines, who has had at least one, possibly more, near death experiences. The one we will focus on today is when an SUV hit her when she was riding her bicycle. Nancy was a scientist and an atheist at the time, but she received profound spiritual wisdom, which she outlines in her book, Awakenings from the Light, 12 Life Lessons from a Near-Death Experience. Nancy is a spiritual teacher, she's a speaker, an author, an amazing artist, and today we will be talking about her near-death experiences, her spiritual experiences, And we'll also hear some of the conversation around her father and some after-death communication that she had at the time of his death. Nancy Ryans, thank you so much for joining me and welcome to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Take us back. Where do we begin with your story? I don't, you know, I don't want to go too far back. I think a lot of people have heard, you know, a lot of my story already, but I think it's it's good to kind of get a, a sense of where I was when um, this accident happened, I mean, where I was in my life. And I, I, talk, I talk a little bit about it in the book, but just to kind of, in case, you know, people haven't read that or don't, don't want to read it, that's fine. Um, up until, uh, so the accident happened when I was 46. So it was not a spring chicken. And um, I was a scientist at that time, actually a science writer and a technical writer, but I had been a scientist from the time I was in my, you know, early to mid twenties after I went to university, um, I had studied geology and archeology span at university. And the geology part was really more of, um, paleoclimate, which means what was the climate doing in the distant past? So, and how, how do we find that out? So that's kind of what I did in school. You know, and afterward, um, most of the jobs that I had, I had some jobs related to archaeology, where I was a, an artist, an archaeological artist. Um, but a lot of the stuff that I did really had to do with that geology degree and um, using like satellite. It's really technical, but using satellite data to try to you know find stuff on the ground and that kind of thing. Mm. Remote sensing, not remote viewing, but I can do that too. <laughs> but um, but remote sensing using satellites. And, um, and that's really where I was. I was doing a lot of that work for, you know, those 20 years or so between university and the time I was 46. Um, and, and not unusual uh, for a lot of scientists, but I, I guess I would consider myself an atheist most of the time. Sometimes I kind of wavered a little bit and, and mm-hmm. wanted to believe that there was something, you know, besides physical reality. But mostly I was just so ensconced in in the sciences and and physical reality granted I wasn't a, a quantum physicist and I was I was just a geologist so I was just so engrossed in physical reality as all there was to mm-hmm. this universe 
um, that I had a hard time wrapping my brain around anything else. Now I had weird experience, like weird experiences that were kind of trying to break through that barrier, I think, but I just chalked it up to just some weird thing that happened that was no big deal. Um, and we can talk about those later, but, Mm, um, so at the time I was at the, this time the accident happened, I was not in a good place in my life. I was really unhappy. Um, not, not with my family, not with my friends, nothing external really. It was in here. Um, in hindsight, I would say I was, I was ready for for some kind of a big spiritual shift to happen, but I didn't know that at the time. So I was trying to figure out, well, do I need to get a new job to be happy? You know, what what's what's that external thing um, that's going to make me happy? I was always looking mm. for. Just look at a lot of people. You know, you're looking for that external thing to make your life better, but it was really I later found out kind of an internal. Um, not really failing, but, but emptiness. Um, Mm. and, and that's really what, what was needed in my life was some kind of a spiritual awakening. Um, so that, that sense of unease was kind of predated the accident by three to four months. I think I started feeling that way, like in September, and the accident happened in January. So there was a good three or four months where I was just unhappy and I didn't understand why. And I just, the further that went, like by the time December came around, um, so a few months after that first inkling that something wasn't right, I had a big, like in, now I would call it an intuitive insight or an insight um, that something was going to happen soon. And it was clear as day that something was big was going to happen. In fact, I called my family, my sisters who were not physically close to me, and told them, like, you know, I don't know why I'm saying this because I don't believe in this stuff, but I think something's (laughs) going to happen. And if something does happen, you know, I kind of gave them the rundown of like, you know, um, you know, how to get into my house, you know, that kind of thing, who yeah. to call. And, you know, I was really a little bit freaked out, especially with some of the dreams that I was having. Um, <clears throat> and I was having dreams of butterflies, which I don't really never have had a thing with butterflies. I think they're cool, but there was no special thing about mm. butterflies. But I have these dreams of being surrounded by literally thousands of butterflies. And then I had dreams of some of, of um, a, a deceased woman coming to me kind of in my dreams. And it was really odd. I remember what she mm. looked like. And I told did you one of my, her? I did not, but she was my sister's friend. Uh, wow. It turns out my older sister's friend who died in her, I can't remember how old she was. I think she was in her 20s, but I'm not sure on that. So it was a while ago, like, Mm. you know, 20 years prior, this woman had died, looked, I mean, I I described this person to my sister and I could, she did one of those (gasps) intakes of air on the other side of the phone. (laughs) And she said, oh my God, I think that was Rhonda, her friend who had, who had passed. And and I described her to a T, like I had this clear vision of what this woman looked like. She had long red hair, you know, curly red hair, her skin tone, what her weight was. I mean, the whole, Mm. I had her down to a T and, um, and I'd never met, I'd never met her. She, She, my older sister is, you know, 10 years older than me. So we just didn't, we weren't around each other a lot. Mm. Um, but I'd never met, you know, a lot of her adult friends anyway, because I had, you know, we'd gone our separate ways Mm. physically. I'd move on to school. So I'd never met this woman. Um, but she also, this woman had an, it was an obsession with butterflies, which I never knew. I mean, I didn't know the woman, I didn't know her obsession with butterflies, but this woman Rhonda had an obsession with butterflies. And I think she was somehow communicating with me in those dreams before my accident. 
I don't know exactly what she was trying to say other than yeah. something's coming. There's a big shift coming. And I think she was probably trying to say it'll be fine. But mm. my, my older sister was kind of freaked out that mm. Rhonda was there to take me away, you know. Um, oh, I can <laughs> probably make them listen to you a little bit more when you're saying, I think something's going to happen. And if it does, here's how you get into my house. Like, how did your family react to that? Um, well, my, the two sisters that I told that to were not pleased, uh, <laughs> to yeah. say the least. We had, we had lost, an, you know, another one of my sisters had died in a car accident oh. a while back. So they had they had that in their minds, like, mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, we can't lose another sister. You mm -hmm. know, this is just not – that's where their mind went or was to my, you know, my sister Kathy who had passed. Mm -hmm. So, it, But I, I really wanted to just be straight and up front with them. I'm like, you know, this is what it – I don't know if I can change anything. I'll try, but, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if I have any control over this, and if I don't, you know, I kind of, it was kind of, I think, good for me to be released of a lot of that stuff, like, you know, mm -hmm. making sure they knew I love them and that kind of thing. But um, so they weren't, I guess they weren't surprised when the accident actually happened. Um, and I think that was probably three weeks after the really clear identification of Rhonda as the person in my dream. So there's a, you know, kind of a three week gap there where, you know, I was just trying to sit with it for a while and, mm -hmm. and, um, kind of helping them, you know, stay focused and stay, you know, not focusing on, on anything negative, but just, you know, maybe I'm, I thought, well, maybe I'm just making stuff up, you know, maybe <laughs> I'm just full of it and it's, and this is coming from nowhere, you know, yeah. um, but when the accident happened, it was, it was, um, you know, I was out biking in town, which I did all the time. It was not unusual for me to be on my bike. I biked a lot. I was biking anywhere between 100 and 125 miles a week oh, at wow, that time. Yeah. Yeah. So I was out a lot. Um, and in a lot of it was on roads. And I know it's not the safest, but in that area where I lived in uh, Colorado, there were a lot of cyclists out there. So it wasn't like I was the only one on the road and people weren't mm. used to seeing cyclists. There were a lot of us out there. Um, and there were bike lanes and, you know, bike paths. So, <clears throat> you know, they did, they did a pretty good job of keeping bicyclists away from traffic. But, you know, on this particular day, I had, I, I had to go through a traffic circle um, to get to where I wanted to go because I, had, I needed to do an errand, you know, on the other side of, of all that. And, and, and that's when I ran into the problem. Um, there was a woman that was coming into the circle. I was in it like, you know, like this. And she was coming in from my right. And... Um, I didn't know it at the time, but she was texting on her phone and wasn't paying attention to where she was driving or that she needed to stop <laughs> before, mm. you know, entering the circle. So she hit me broadside and, um, you know, a lot of stuff happened really amazingly to help me survive. I, I can't believe, honestly, it was like a one in probably a billion chance of me even surviving that accident. Um, but there was a, a physician, an ER physician, emergency room physician who was in the vehicle behind me. Oh my goodness. I hear but he was all the time. It's amazing. Right there. I know. Yeah. Like I couldn't have had better care on site. And then um, another person who came up and I don't know where she came from, but she identified herself as a, uh, as a trauma nurse. And she came from somewhere, she had a different vehicle, I mm -hmm. think, or whatever. I don't know. She came from a different direction. And so I had her, <clears throat> she was the one that was there first and kind of held me down after the accident happened and made sure I didn't get up because that was really the danger is it's bad enough to get hit like that. But if you get up and try to move, you could really injure yourself even more um, mm -hmm. than if you stay still. 
The problem is that when you're in that mode, you're in panic mode. And what you want to do, at least what I wanted to do, is get up and run. That was like I was trying desperately to get up and run as fast as I could. Mm-hmm. And, and if I had done that, um, I probably would not have survived because my, you know, my neck was really badly broken. Uh, my back, my lower back was basically in pieces. There wasn't anything left holding it together. It was bad. Mm. Um, so if I had, you know, if I had tri- really tried in, in earnest to get up and run, um, well, the ER doctor said you probably wouldn't have lived to make it to the hospital. Mm. That's how bad it would have been. So luckily, you know, that woman showed up and put her hands kind of on my shoulders to hold me down. And, and you know, it turned out, you know, my injuries were really, really severe, You know, as you could imagine, it was, I I don't know. They stopped counting bone breaks at over 100. Um, Oh, wow. Yeah, there were fractures upon fractures upon fractures everywhere. Um, It was, you know, and up to that point, I I was like in the ER, in the emergency room, kind of joking, because that was the only way I knew how to deal with this. You know, I made it through the, the accident. And I'm just laying there and I told the nurse, I'm like laughing, I've never broken a bone in my life. And now (laughs) now you have. Oh wow. Now like everything is broken. (laughs) Yeah. Gosh. Um, But that's really what it was. I had never I'd, you know, I'd been in accidents before, but not ever really broken any bones. Mm. So this was this was a big deal for me. Um, so it, you know, they decided that that in order for me to be able to walk again, because I was, my neck and back were um, in really bad shape, uh, really, really, really bad. Mm-hmm. If, and they needed to do surgery in order to kind of clean out the broken bits that were in there. And then then really what they wanted to do was they wanted to insert um, titanium rods in my along my spine so that I would heal up, you know, vertical, and everything could heal while I was still kind of mobile. You know, they wanted me mm-hmm. to at least be a little bit mobile, you know, while things were healing. Even, you know, even though they they knew that I had to be in one of those clamshell casts, it kind of looks like um, it's a white polycarbonate, like, body cast that yep. goes around you. Yep. Oh, Jay. Um, so I knew I had to be in that, but but that wasn't enough because of all the breaks. And so that's – they also wanted to have – the titanium on either side of my spine um, to make sure that everything was going to heal properly because the clamshell cat, those clamshell body casts, they're not miracle workers. And and because I had so much trauma back there, they needed that extra stability. Mm. Um, So, you know, a few days later, they brought me into the operating room to put the, the titanium in my back and also to, you know, just clean stuff up and get stuff back to where it needed to be. Um, and, and that's when I had my near-death experience. It's when I died on, on the operating table. It wasn't really anybody's fault, you know. I had had surgeries before, never had a problem like this. Um, it, it was maybe just a weird reaction between the trauma and the anesthesia. Mm. They're not really sure. But but uh, as soon as that as soon as they I got the full injection of the general anesthetic, I was out like not you know not unconscious but like yeah. dying Ouch. on me <laughs> like <laughs> gone. Um, but my heart rate if in my physical body my heart rate basically stopped. My breathing went to zero and my blood pressure just tanked completely mm-hmm. um, and. You know, they don't, they don't call that as in, in, in the U S they would call that a code blue if it was in the emergency room, but they don't call codes like that in the operating room. So they just did what they could, you know, to get Mm. things going back again. Um, but I didn't, I, you know, I didn't know that that was going on. All I knew is that all of a sudden I wasn't in the operating room anymore. I'm looking around like, Hmm, this is weird. I'm outside <laughs> and I'm standing up. 
Uh, and I didn't think I'd be, st- I was still trying to process like, what's going on here? Like, mm. is this real or is this, what is this? Is this a hallucination? Because I was standing up in the middle of a meadow, like on a mountainside. Um, and just looking, it was rolling mountains. It wasn't big mountains like the Alps or the Rocky Mountains or something like that. These are rolling mountains. But I was in a meadow surrounded by beautiful flowers and trees kind of off in the distance. And I'm, I'm just trying, like, pr- trying to process what's going on. And I'm thinking, well, is this a hallucination? So I kind of went through my mental check of, no, you know, I've, I've had a, a, a reaction to uh, a painkiller in the distant past that caused me to hallucinate. This isn't anything like that. You know, that was just crazy, weird, bizarre mm-hmm. stuff. This is very lucid and very, it felt real. I mean, it felt real. It felt more real than here. And that's what I started to think about was like, wow, this feels like I know this place. This feels really real. And, and, um, and then I started to feel, I don't even know how I knew that this is what it was, but I felt, I started to feel love coming from outside of me as if it was heat or a warm energy or something like that. And I don't even know how I knew that at the time, but that I knew that it was some kind of divine or universal love. That's all like, that's the only thing that was coming into my brain was like, wow, well, my mind was that this is love. And then I felt peace. And then I started to feel like sensations on what I perceived of as my body, like someone was hugging me or holding me um, and just Mm -hmm. comforting me. And I'm like, whoa, what's, you know, this is crazy. And I started to think, well, wait a minute. If this, is this heaven? Is this where we go when we die? Because if it is, you know, all my training as a kid, I was raised a Roman Catholic. Mm. I shouldn't be here. You know, this isn't, why am I here? I don't believe in any of this anyway. I, you know, my, in my schooling and my mom, you know, tells me that I should be burning in hell, um, uh, for, for believing what I did. Mm. And there was this kind of a welcoming message. It wasn't really, it was a voice, but it wasn't a voice. It was a voice that kind of came from everywhere, but it wasn't an audible voice. Like, you know, we're talking, mm. it was like a heart based message directly into me. It wasn't, it wasn't an audible thing, but the the message was effectively was what, this is what it said. It said, this is your home. You're, you're a part of me. You're, you are my child or you're, you're a part of me and and this love welcome home. And uh, that, that part still, you know, kind of chokes me up because I didn't feel like I deserved it. Mm-hmm. We all deserve it. But in, in that moment, I, I, I didn't feel like I deserved it because I had turned my back on anything spiritual for so long. And, and I knew, though, that to this divine presence, whatever it is, it it didn't matter. That didn't mean I was off the hook. It just meant that I was still loved. Mm. Um, but I still had things that I needed to do and, and amends that I needed to make in order to, you know, keep, keep moving on in my spiritual journey. But I was, it, but I was loved and I was accepted no matter what. And, and that's the message really for everyone. You know, when I, when I counsel people who are terminally ill, that's usually the one thing that they're afraid of the most. They're afraid of, one, one person even said, I'm afraid that I've disappointed God. Mm. And I said, you can't. It's not possible. Mm. You know, you're loved beyond your ability to really understand it. But I get it because I was there. Um, mm. 
And it took me a while to really ease into that and really understand what that meant. But, you know, that's, that was me. That was, that was my acceptance, you know, into that, into that divine realm. But, but I, but I wasn't off the hook yet. I wasn't like sent back right away. <laughs> Darn it. Um, I, I wanted to stay. But then I saw uh, this figure of a person or a a spiritual being. She wasn't really, she was just wearing a, the shape of a human so that it would be easier for me to relate to her. Um, mm-hmm. But she was a spiritual being and um, had lived a life, at least one, at least one life here, you know, on this planet. Uh, but she was there to teach me some stuff. And she said, you know, I'm here to help you learn some things so that when you go back to your life on earth, it, you, you'll be able to make it into one that you would be proud to live. So I'm going to give you tools to improve your life and, and then we'll send you back. And, and I did not, I was not buying into this. I did not <laughs> want to come back here. <laughs> Uh-huh. You know, even with my family, even with my daughter, and I know a lot of people are horrified because I have a daughter when I say that, but I knew she was going to be absolutely A-OK. I wanted to see her grow up, yes, but it was so easy to stay in that place, it, mm. it, you know, that emotional, emotionally easy, I would say, to stay there and just be there. Um, but this, this, you know, my teacher said, well, you've already agreed to go back. And I said, what? <laughs> I did not remember yeah. that. <laughs> when did I do that? <laughs> when, yeah. when did I agree to that? Um, and apparently, you know, so, so she showed me, you see it sometimes in movies, and there was a really good example of it in the movie um, called The Shack that came out, I don't know, four, maybe four or five years ago. And in this movie, it's about a near-death experiencer, but there's this vision, this, he has his life review and it's done in the air in front of him. Like the air in front of him was a movie screen. Well, that's kind of what she showed me. She showed me this in front of me. Now this was a couple of years before the shack came out. So I didn't have that working in my brain, um, Mm. just in case you're wondering, but, but it was similar to that where I saw in front of me in the air she showed me a vision of, or her vision of me agreeing to experience some things or, you know, agreeing to some of the things that I wanted to learn or do before coming in here to my life. And as soon as she showed that to me, so she showed it to me from her perspective because she was an onlooker of all of this. Mm -hmm. But I remembered being in that place and it was like all of a sudden the memory was right there for me. Like, oh yeah, now I remember. Well, shoot, I wonder if I can get out of it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah. But I remember, you know, so I remembered that I had agreed to, you know, just in general, some of the things I wanted to learn or do. Um, And and there was another point that was important, which will be important later, is there were two other points in my life, very distinct points in my life prior to this, um, where I could have made a shift into a more spiritual life or mindset Mm -hmm. without having to go through the trauma of an accident Mm -hmm. and near-death experience. But I turned away. Those are two distinct points that I, I knew at the time there was something really important about this, but I wasn't ready to deal with it. So I just turned away from what I was being led to. Mm-hmm. And if I would have, you know, who would have, could have, should have, you know, I don't know. But, but those would have been two earlier and probably easier times where I could have made this spiritual shift. Who knows? Um, it, it, it doesn't really matter in the long run, but but it's just interesting that I remember those two points now and, and kind of put them together with my my life plan. Yeah. You know? So you remember them in hindsight after you've had your near-death experience. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I remembered at the time that they that I had experienced those things that I knew something odd had just happened and that it was an opportunity and I knew there was potentially an opportunity here to dive into that thing further and mm -hmm. go down a more spiritual path but because of my job and because of who I was with in my life mm -hmm. um my my partner it would have it was really hard for me to wrap my brain around ditching all of that mm. and turning my back on all of that. I wasn't I wasn't courageous enough at that point I think to to make that change because it's a big it's it can be a big mm. shift for people who are you know in the sciences to to mm. make that big of a shift. Um mm. and I wasn't ready. So you know, I didn't do that. But so when she showed that to me, I thought, okay, well, I'll just go along with this and learn what I'm supposed to learn. And then maybe I can convince her to let me stay. You know, it, the, <laughs> yeah, I was still kind of working that angle. Like I really want, I, I wanted to be with my sister who had, you know, predeceased me. I wanted to be with my dad who had, you know, passed away a while back and other friends who had, who had crossed over. So I just wanted to see everybody again. And, and I didn't get the chance to do that with her. Um, but that's really what I wanted, is I wanted to just keep, I just wanted to go and, and be with them again. Um, but I, you know, I did as she asked, and I was a good student, or at least I tried to be. I wasn't always <laughs> great, but I did my best. And, uh, and, I, and she taught me a bunch of stuff uh, that's, all of it's in the book and are on my website or in my blog. It's, it's all out there. Uh, but a lot of it had to do with, with love, really. The, the, the core element mm -hmm. of, of basically everything, it came down to love. Like love is the structure of not only the physical universe, but all parts of the universe, all levels of the universe, and, and literally all levels of the multiverse, because it isn't just mm -hmm. this one universe. So it's all connected with love. And it's interesting that since then, you know, the, the way that I do things like, um, you know, I do remote viewing, I can do some energy work remotely from people. And I do all that by connecting to that, that infinite field of love. I don't know that a lot of people have talked about that's how they do it, but that's how I do it. Um, and so if, you know, for me, I can connect to that now very intentionally and, you know, we do out of body work or out of body travel, or astral travel, um, all of that stuff, all of that knowledge is accessible through that field of divine love. Um, I know Irvin Laszlo calls it the Akashic field. Others mm -hmm. do too. Um, you know, it's the divine matrix, all that, but you, you know, I learned that was when I started to learn that it was real and and it we were a part of it. We're all a part of it. Mm, mm. We can't not be a part of it. We can't separate ourselves from that in you know in reality. We can it, try to ignore it like I did for so long, but it's still there. Um so that was really the core kind of the core teaching of all of what I learned was really love, you know, and aspects of love, like gratitude, um, connection to, you know, staying connected to other people, helping other people, you know, being of service to other people, mm -hmm. um, learning that we all have choices in our lives that we can make choice that choice is a thing. It's real. Um, mm -hmm. and things are not predetermined, but we do have choice. Uh, and that we're very powerful because we have that ability to choose. So that those were all all interwoven. You, you can't really pull one lesson out because they were all like connected like this. Mm -hmm. You know, they were all mm -hmm. interwoven together. You couldn't she couldn't teach one without teaching all the others. They're all part of the same core lesson of love. Yeah. So, you know, and I did have a life review, which I didn't know that's what it was at the time, but 
you know, I didn't have the words for any of this stuff. I didn't even yeah. know about near death experiences. Uh -huh. So I didn't know that that's what this, what that was I was experiencing was, you know, a life review or whatever. Um, so that was quite different to the moment with, you talked about the lady showing you on the screen in front of you. That was quite different to the life review? Yeah, the life review was completely different. Um, she took me to like a lake or a small pond, a pond really a small lake or a, a large pond um, and it looked like it was up in the mountains but you know what I was seeing was really just a, a construct for me it wasn't mm -hmm. when I describe what I saw it was just something that was there kind of the room that I was in that was um making me feel it, you know, calm and peaceful so that I could learn what I needed to learn. They were just, it was, I was being surrounded with an environment that would make me feel comfortable. Um, and so for me, it's being outdoors and in the mountains. So she brought me to this, what looked like a, a, a pond in the mountains and it had a very dark, a very dark surface. And, and nowadays I call it the sacred pond. Uh, or the pond of sacred wisdom or something. I always I call it weird things, but, but it was a really weird sacred, I could tell it was a sacred space. And she said, well, I want, what I want you to do is kneel down at the edge of the pond and just gently touch the surface of the pond with your hand. And then just sit back and watch and, and just see what happens. And I'm like, well, I was kind of being snarky at that point. And I said, well, I know what's going to happen. You know, I touch the surface and there's going to be ripples that, yeah. you know, cascade. Like she said, and she, she literally, I could see her in her human like form. She literally crossed her arms like this, you know, like just do it. You know, mm -hmm. she was getting really, you know, not really tired of me, but really tired of my attitude, I think. You know, I think our, our guardian angels are probably more angelic than we give them credit for, for having to put up they with put all up this. They put up with a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, she, she said, just do it. And so I did it. And, and I sat back on my, on my heels, kind of, you know, just moved back and I watched the whole surface. And it was very interesting because she was teaching me several things at once which I didn't really kind of put together right away. It took me a little while to figure this out. The first thing that I saw was the ripples, obviously. And the, the message from that and the teaching that she gave me in, in relation to that was that everything that you do has an effect on everything around you. Mm -hmm. So it's like your hand touching the pond creates ripples on the surface. Well, everything that you do and say in your life has a ripple effect too. Mm. It, it, it not only with the people around you, but also spiritually. There's a like a vibe, if you will, that goes out. A spirit you 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 put out those spiritual energy um, waves, and that affects the the world too. Mm. So we you know that's when I learned mm, maybe I need to be a little bit more careful with what I say and do and even think, you know, because it's really important. The other thing that happened is across the surface of this pond, there were all of a sudden like hundreds of these little, I call them little YouTube videos. They look like little videos on the, mm -hmm. on the surface of these ripples all across the pond. And there were hundreds of them. And when I looked at one, what I noticed is they were, they were moments in my life, different mm -hmm. moments that were important. They may not be, you know, like flying to the moon important, but they were interactions with other people that were important. And two of them, is, it, there were, I looked at many, many, but two, I'll just talk about two. Two of them were very important for me in really understanding how connected we all are. So the first one was an incident where I was really negative to my younger sister. And this was when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I knew full well what I was doing. I was intentionally really trying to be nasty to her. Um, 
and I don't remember even why, but, but I was trying to really be mean, you know, just flat out mm -hmm. mean to her. And she was three years younger than me, and she did not take it very well. She felt really, really hurt and rejected and almost like I hated her. You know, she just felt awful. Well, when I looked at this little video of that particular incident, I felt what she felt. It was like I was in her place mm. on the receiving end of my negativity. And I just couldn't handle it. It was like, oh my God, now I know what she felt and there's no mm. way I want to ever do that to anybody again. Um, I hadn't really thought about my impact on her in that moment. I was just thinking about me. Mm. And when I was able to feel what she felt and think what she thought, then I realized, oh my gosh, we are all connected. There is nothing that I do that doesn't impact somebody else. Mm. Um, and, and I felt really bad. Like I was really beating myself up a lot about that one. Mm. And my teacher said, you know, that's not the point of this. The point isn't for you to come out of this beating yourself up. That's not the point. The point is for you to learn and, and to make it a different decision in the future. You know, that's the whole point of this is for you to grow and, and change as a result of this. And so she balanced that particular incident out with an incident where I was very kind to someone who I didn't know. Um, and it was at Christmas time. It, a lot of people have heard the story, but it's a, I was in a grocery store at Christmas and the clerk who was checking everybody out was having a really, really rough day. And the person that had me in line was not very nice to this woman, to the, to the clerk. So when I got up, uh, you know, to where I was going to check out, I just told the woman she was doing an awesome job and I thanked her for being there. And I, you know, I just did as much as I could to make her feel good mm. and, and thanked her for all of the time that she was spending with all of these cranky people at the holiday because it was right, right before Christmas. Right. Um, yeah. So again, the, I was able to feel what she felt and her heart just soared. Like she just, it, what I said was minor, you know, at least to me, but it really lifted her up so that she didn't carry that negative stuff home with her to her kids mm -hmm. that night. And that's what it was all about. This this life review was was learning how for, for me anyway how to make different decisions, and and how my decisions affect other people. So that was that's kind of in a nutshell what my life review was all mm. about. Mm. Wow, yeah. there's and, quite a lot in there, isn't there? Like in terms of you've had all these lessons, being able to bring the lessons back and put them into practice here. What was yeah. that like for you? Well, it, you know, at first I thought that I was going to forget everything. That was what I was terrified of the most. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, but even with dreams, I don't remember dreams very well. Oh, and I was like, me neither. Oh how am I going to remember all of this? And I, I actually asked that of her before they sent me, or she sent me back. And she said, don't, don't worry about that. You know, you'll mm -hmm. remember everything. Um, you know, don't worry. And, and at first when I did come back, it was a little fuzzy. However, you know, the big stuff was super crystal clear, like, but there was a few details that were a little bit like I couldn't quite remember, was that pond in the mountains or was it not? You know, stuff like that. Mm. Um, but I, but as soon as I was able to start writing it down, which was like the next day, then it became really clear. Like all of a sudden, it was right, right back there again. And I, I but I wrote as much down as I could before. I thought, well, maybe I'm going to continue to forget this. I didn't know what was going to happen. So I started to write that down right away. A friend of mine brought in a notebook, and I was just doing the best I could to write. And, um, and I thought, well, if I forget all of it, then at least I'll have this notebook. 
Well, the notebook ended up being my saving grace. I, I did not ever forget anything, by the way. Mm-hmm. But I, I was able to go through it in the, com- in the next few months and, and kind of dive deeper and deeper and deeper into those teachings. And it took me, well, I, I mean, I'm still probably still growing and learning as a result of that. But I would say it took me a good two years almost to really start to embrace all as much of that as I could for the first for the first 18 months I was kind of overwhelmed with it all because it was just so big Mm -hmm. and and I would take a little bit and I would I would try to do I would try to bring one thing into my life because that's all I could do at Mm -hmm. any one time was one thing um and so I would spend months and months learning how to meditate again Mm -hmm. or doing one small practice. So it took me a while to kind of get where I wanted to be. And I would just keep rereading my notes and and those notes became my book, Awakenings from the Light. Um, But it was really hard. Uh, Certain lessons were just, I didn't want to go there. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to listen to my heart and listen to my intuition because I didn't think it was worthwhile. Mm. Um, but then the more that I did, the better my life got. So then I start, it was this gradual shift of, oh, okay, well, I'll try that and see how it goes. So it was just gradual little things that I did, you know, over the, well, and now it's been almost eight years, but over the next several years, but it took me almost two years to, to be, to, to, um, I was, I was angry. I was still angry that I was sent back and I didn't know it. It was this underlying sense of anger that I had for two years. That was, it was minor, but it was still there. And I, and I, and it was holding me back. I knew there was something holding me back from really embracing these teachings. And it was, it was that anger. I was mad. I was so mad they sent me back without my, in, in, you know, in my viewpoint, without my permission. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because I had been sent back against my wishes at that particular time. And there was a moment where I had one of those aha awakening moments. I was driving my vehicle. And I don't ever want to have these things happen while I'm driving a vehicle. But I was driving a via- my car or my SU- my little SUV alongside the mountains in Colorado. And all of a sudden it hit me like, oh my God, I'm still mad they sent me back here. <laughs> <laughs> and I started crying. And I had I pulled over as soon as I could find a, a safe place to do it. I pulled over mm-hmm. and I just let it all out. And and as I, I was bawling like a baby Mm -hmm. um, and just let it all go. Like, and I knew I was released. I could feel it just releasing Mm -hmm. because I'd been asking to know what it was that was holding me back. And when I found out, I'm like, I'm ready to be done with this. And so it was really only after that happened that I, I really started living this stuff more mm. on a daily basis because I had that space in my heart to be able to do so. Um, but so it, it can take a while, you know, mm. for people to put these things into practice. And it's hard because you lose, I, I lost friends as a result of all this. Yeah, stuff. that can be the thing, isn't it? because you end up going on a slightly different pathway to what you've been on and that change can be incredibly hard. Yeah. That brings me back to a thought that I had a little while back when you were talking. Do you think that you talked about how there were two significant events in your life and then your near-death experience? Do you think the near-death experiences would have happened had you taken one of those options earlier in life? No. No. No, it was like three, 
There were three different paths to get me to where I wanted to go, mm. which was a more spiritually connected life. And, you know, some, some other stuff that's on that path. So I knew I kind of, my soul knew where it wanted to be. Mm. And I had three points, three, three different pathways to get there. Mm. Um, one of them would have been when I was a kid, when I was a child. Um, it, it's, it's so, so several other NDEers think that I had a childhood NDE as well. Um, it's very, very possible. I had a really bad accident when I was a kid where I fell off of a three-story building. Not mm. kidding. Onto concrete. Oh, Turned out wow. I was, didn't break a bone or anything. But I was out for 45 minutes. I, you know, I wasn't breathing for a little while. Um, but all I remember, you know, I don't remember that one as much. I don't remember really anything about it except this warm white light. That's all I remember mm. from it. However, I came out of that very spiritual, like for a good 10 years. Mm. Um, I, was, I was little miss spiritual kid. Not, not religious, but spiritual. Mm. And I, you know, I, I remember seeing, you know, the divine everywhere. And I tell my dad that we'd be walking around town or driving around town. Like, oh my God, Dad! I I just see God everywhere, and I didn't know how else to describe it. And he he'd be like, "What? <laughs> this five year old kid or six year old kid?" And all of a sudden, she's talking about seeing God everywhere. I'm like, mm. "That's how I that, but that's how I was up until you know my mid to late teens." Mm. And and so that was a point, and that was one of them. So I could have stayed on the path then. And, and really given myself over to that spiritual path back then. There was another point later um, when I was 34 when my dad died. And this was the one that probably, this is the one I think that I meant to be the one that, that, made me, you know, go over to the spiritual side of the house. Um, mm. I think this is my, the one my soul really wanted me to, to grab onto because it, a lot of stuff happened around my dad's passing. There were tons of stuff that happened right in this little time period. Um, one, one thing that happened, oh, how long was it before he died? It was about a year before he died. Now he was terminally ill for a while. Um, probably 18 months before he finally passed. Mm. But about a year before he passed, um, he wanted to, he was a big, you know, outdoors guy. He liked to hunt. I did not hunt, but he liked to hunt. And he wanted to go deer hunting. He was not in shape to do that. I mean, he was really ill. He had cancer. Um, he could barely even like carry anything, let alone be outdoors all day hunting. Mm. Mm. But good daughter that I was, I wanted him to have the experience because it might be his last. And so I went with him and made sure that he was safe. But before we actually went out, you know, so that was like, I, I arrived there. I think it was a Friday night. I lived a little ways away from them, so I always stayed with my parents, um, you know, when I came to visit. So I came out on a Friday afternoon, stayed over. Um, Saturday morning, um, we were going to get up and leave pretty early to go hunting, but I was up. I couldn't sleep. So I got up and I was meditating. Um, and, and as I was kind of coming out of that meditative state, all of a sudden I was in somebody else's life. It was the b most bizarre mm. thing. Um, there wasn't like a visitor in my room, but all of a sudden I was experiencing the life of a young man um, from a long, long time ago. And his name was Sydney. And I had no idea. I had never met a Sydney in my life. I didn't know mm. who this person was. And this Sydney 
showed me a couple of, he was very insistent that, that I live a couple of these points in his life. One of them was he was standing in a, in a, in a clearing somewhere up in like the Northern part of the United States uh, where mm -hmm. my dad's family had a vacation home. And he was standing there with three other young boys. They were in, in, you know, 17, 18 years old range. One of them was my dad at, at like 17. And this kid, Stanley, whose body I was in, was talking to my dad and we, he was calling him Willie. My dad's name is William, but nobody ever called him Willie ever in my, like that. I've mm -hmm. never heard anybody call him that. It was either Bill or Sir, you know, mm -hmm. or Dad. You know that that was that was how it was. And so um, this this kid named Stanley was was joking with my dad Willie and calling him Willie and teasing him and do you know just things that boys do when they're out you know in the woods. Um, and they were just having a good time and they were getting ready to go hunting. And then fast forward, so so I saw that I got to see and experience some of their interaction, and then and then um, Sydney pulled me ahead in time to, um, I believe it would have been the Korean War. He was a, I think he was like a year or two older than my dad, and so he actually volunteered um, to go fight in the Korean War, and. Um, it was one that we don't, you know, in the United States, we don't talk about it a lot, but it, it was a, it was a big deal for people of that generation because it was kind of the start of the cold war between the U S and, and then um, the Soviet union. And, and Sydney took me to certain points of, of his life there as he was fighting in Korea. And, and then he brought me, um, it was hard to watch because I was in his body as during the day he died because he was in a firefight and died in combat. And it was, it was horrifying to me to like be in the, I've never been at war before. And here I am in the middle of this with him. Mm -hmm. And I knew it wasn't me. I knew that this was a, a, another soul who was allowing me to see his life. And then he he and then I I kind of got back into my body and then and then Sydney was there with me and he said, um, "Tell Willie that it'll be okay that I'll be with him." And I assume he meant when my dad finally died. But tell Willie it's okay. Tell Willie that I'm okay. But and I, and he said, "Tell Willie I'm really sorry that I couldn't come back from Korea to be with him because they were really best Aww. buddies." Oh man. And uh I'm like, okay, I'll do a, I'll do it. And I at this time I'm like, I don't even know what this is, but I'm I came out of the meditation and went, what was that all about? Yeah, I bet. <laughs> um and and so I went, you know, my dad was up and about and we were getting ready to go hunting and we're getting putting the stuff in his truck. Um, and you know, my mom's not there. So I, I never felt comfortable talking about this around her. I just didn't know how she would react. But I, I mm -hmm. said to him, dad, I need to ask you something really weird. Would you just li like, listen to this? He said, sure. Um, cause I knew he was a great believer in reincarnation. So I thought he might be able to handle this, mm -hmm. <laughs> even though I couldn't, I said, did did you ever know anybody named Sydney? And his eyes went, he like, he kind of reared back like this and his oh. eyes got really big. And I said, did he used to call you Willie? And he started, like my dad started crying. I never saw my yeah. dad cry. Just started a little bit. And he said, yeah, he was my, my childhood best friend and he died in Korea. And I never, I've never really oh. told anybody about him. Oh my goodness. Like, well, Sydney came to me this morning <laughs> and Sydney wanted you to know that he's okay. 
And then he's really sorry he didn't come back from, from Korea because he was supposed to come back and, and you guys were going to hang out, but he's sorry that he couldn't make it back. Um, but he's, you know, he wanted you to know that he's okay and that he's here for you whenever you need him. Oh man. And my dad, he just, he was so embarrassed to be crying. He just turned and kind of, I could tell he was trying to kind of gather his, himself mm -hmm. together. But so apparently what I told him hit the nail on the head. It was like, I, I didn't know Sydney. He didn't even tell my mom about Sydney. Nobody knew about Sydney until I just out of the blue talked about Sydney that morning. And um, so that was a point. That was one point. The other part of this whole story around my dad was, you know, I tried to put the weirdness of that aside. I tried not to think about how astounding that was. Because mm. mm. um, in hindsight, it's astounding. You know, like, here's a dead guy from 50 years ago comes back and tells you something about your dad. You know? um, but I tried not to think about, it. I think cause I was dealing really with my dad's terminal illness and it was, that was so hard, you know, in and of itself. So it, it, my dad finally did die a year later and I was, um, I was six hours away at that time that I lived quite a ways away by a car. And I knew the moment he died, it was four in the morning. Um, I woke up and saw him at the foot of my bed. And he didn't say mm -hmm. anything, but I knew he mm -hmm. was leaving. And I told him it was, okay. you know, I said, it's okay. I get it. I know you need to go. Um, mm -hmm. And I could feel him and sense and almost see that he walked. It was almost like he really truly did walk behind a veil and he mm -hmm. just faded away. Um, and just at that moment, the phone rang mm -hmm. and it was my brother who, has, who, who was sitting with my dad while he passed. Um, my brother called and said, you know, dad passed away. And I said, I know. <laughs> he was just here. <laughs> he just said goodbye. So I drove over there. Uh, you know, I got there later that morning, midday ish time frame. And I was with my partner at the time who he was a scientist too. And he would have, I never told him any of this stuff because he would have thought I was stark raving crazy. <laughs> so I never spoke about any of this really. And, um, so we get to the front door of my parents' home, and by then, um, you know, the, the funeral home people had come to take my, my dad's body down to the funeral home for preparations for the funeral. Mm. But we opened the front door, and as soon as I touched the front door, you know, to kind of open it, I heard music. But it wasn't music coming into the ears, because my partner didn't hear it. I asked him, do you hear that? And he's like, hear what? You know, we were out, in, my, my parents lived out in the middle of the boonies in the mountains mm -hmm. and nobody else around. So it was birds and them, you know, so, and I knew this wasn't birds. It was, it sounded like choral music in a cathedral or something, but multiplied by mm -hmm. about a million. There, it felt there were, like there was a million different voices singing all in unison. And it was joyful. It was just, I just felt so much peace mm -hmm. and joy when I heard that. And I knew my dad was okay. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how I knew it, but, I, but that was what I came to understand later. It was like the echoes of him and his soul kind of getting to that higher spiritual level of what you might call heaven or whatever. But Mm. It was that that song, people call it the song of heaven. Well, that's what it sounded like. It sounded like a million beautiful voices singing all in harmony. Mm. And that lasted for several minutes. I walked in. Um, there was no music playing on the stereo. 
my mom was crying, obviously, my brother was crying, and nobody else heard it except me. Oh, that's uh, and I didn't know what it was, but it was, I heard that again later when I actually died. Um, so that was really that those two, those two pieces of that kind of came into play, you know, <clears throat> during the time that around my dad's passing that year, a year long mm -hmm. time, that was the point at which I was really supposed to make the shift. Um, but especially with my dad's passing and experiencing, you know, um, especially hearing the music and seeing him. But again, I didn't go there. It was just too scary, you know. Mm. It would have upset my life a lot. And I didn't, I really, I knew it. I knew at the time that this was probably not the right choice to make, but I did it anyway. And I mm. just... So I can't deal with this right now. I just can't. Mm. I think a lot of us can relate to that. Maybe not to the extent of changing your whole life, but I think a lot of us have things we know we should be doing and it kind of tugs on our heart a little bit, but it's so much easier just to carry on or just to turn the other way or something like that. And it's almost a little bit unfortunate. Well, I'm not sure whether it is or not, actually. I haven't quite worked that out for you to have such a big change ahead of you, to have these forks in the road that require so much. And, you know, you said that you didn't think that would happen. Your, your accident and the near-death experience would happen if you hadn't had the times before. So, right. yeah, there's, there's another part that you said is that it's about connecting and consciously tapping into, would you call these gifts? Would you say that these are things that you've had most of your life, the ability to tap into seeing things and this, these spiritual works that you have in your life? I think so. I, you know, for a while, I kind of denied them. I mean, I had some stuff happen as a kid. <clears throat> um, before you were five, before that very first accident where you dropped off the building? Um, I don't remember that far back. Mm, hard, isn't it? it? Maybe, but def definitely after that. Um, I did have stuff that happened after that. And I even had some stuff in, in, at university that happened with friends of mine who were like other friends who were scientists who witnessed it. And they were totally weirded out <laughs> by like what I knew. And mm. like all of a sudden I would just spout this stuff off. It's, it was usually as we were traveling to different places, we did a lot of field work and, you know, out in the Western United States and and I'd never really been to any of these places before because I was from the other part of the country, which is a long way away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then um, we'd be driving around. There was one incident, instance um, where I was, you know, we were driving around on a road. I didn't know where we were. I was kind of half asleep in the passenger seat. <clears throat> and we were somewhere in western Colorado with, and on a road I'd never been on before. And I woke up like like this with a start. And I said, you need to pull over right now. Cause there's something back in that Canyon that I want it, that I need to see. Um, it's some kind of a rock art panel. And, and the, the guy that was driving was a geologist. He's like, I didn't even know we passed a Canyon. Like what, how did you even know? Cause you were asleep. And he's driving. <laughs> and he's yeah. driving. I said, right. Just do, do, please do it. Please pull over. I said, there's something back there that I'm supposed to see. And, and he's like, there's nothing back there. Oh, I can imagine. It's, you know, and so we, he turned, he did, he, he humored me. So we turned around, we get out of the car and I said, it's just, it's just back here. So I showed him exact, and there it was this beautiful panel of ancient Native American rock art. And it was the first time I had ever seen it in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. I've never seen, I've always wanted to see. Native American rock art, but I hadn't seen any before. And I, I was just like blown away. It was so beautiful. It was these beautiful red, big, huge paintings that were hidden. You couldn't see them from the road. They were mm. hidden behind the, this canyon was kind of a hidden canyon that you couldn't really see from the direction we were driving. And his eyes were like saucers and he, mm. he was terrified. Like, oh, what the hell is going on? Pardon me? He was terrified. 
he was ter- he's like what is this what do you do like he thought there was some kind of witchcraft or something happening i think i don't know what he was thinking but he was really afraid because yeah. i knew that this was back there it just completely weirded him out like he couldn't he couldn't relate like he mm. couldn't put it into context um with what he knew as a scientist like as a geologist mm. that stuff shouldn't happen you know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know consciousness only exists in your brain right so there's no way you should know stuff that's out there um because you know the brain produces consciousness and that's it so that really freaked him out it really freaked him out um it didn't change the way he thought. He just preferred to never think about it ever again. <laughs> right. Isn't that interesting? And that's another one of those examples where you're being, I guess, forced to confront something and actually make a bit of a scene. No, no, we need to turn around and you have no idea what's coming. This has become a bit of a theme in your life up till that yeah. point, wasn't it? Of these hard yeah. decisions and I have to step out the mold. Yeah, I feel for you in that. Now, I can't help, my mind is wondering, my mind is questioning the woman. So your sister's friend with the long red hair and the butterflies, Uh did you ever see her in your experience? Have you seen her again? What happened to her? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I only saw her a couple, two or three times in dreams before Mm -hmm. my accident, and that was it. Um, Never experienced her again. Um, I think, I don't know. I think she just may have been there maybe as just a comfort, you know, maybe it Mm. was, I don't know, maybe she and I had known each other in another lifetime or, you know, before I was born, she may be someone that I know. Mm. Um, and and she may just have been giving me a heads up, Mm. uh, Maybe she was giving my sister a heads up. That's what I was just thinking is maybe you were just the the pathway for the message to get through to your sister. Yeah. Who knows what's gone through your sister's mind through that experience and what that leads on to. You're talking about the ripple effects and I think the tiniest little things, we just have no clue the impact that they can have. And yeah, yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? There's been a lot there. You've talked about a lot of different concepts. With all of the life lessons that you've had through this, with everything that you got out of this experience, the things that you came back with that you thought you would forget but didn't, what's? it's hard to put it into what's the one big thing, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What's the one big thing? What can we take away from this? Yeah, I think for, for, the, for most people, it's that, It's that we are all, all of us are so loved and we are so connected more than we ever know. Even through all of this weird pandemic stuff, um, at a spiritual level, it doesn't matter what you think of yourself right now. Because I honestly, when this happened, I didn't like myself very much. You are all, every one of you out there, everybody is loved beyond your ability to comprehend it. You are already a part of that divine love, whether you realize it or not. Um, It is you, you are it, you're all a part of it, and you're connected to everyone because of that connection through that divine love. So that to me, ultimately, that is the one core, the big message that underlying or running all through this reality, whatever this reality is, through all of our lives, there is that, that divine loving consciousness that is there, that's a part of all of us, that we're a part of it. We can't, we can't separate ourselves from it. But when you consciously choose to align yourself with that, if you can do that on a, on a daily basis, as much as you can, like meaning in whatever capacity that you can, you're going to make yourself feel so much better just by want, des- the desire to be in alignment with that. The more that you desire it, the more that you're going to do 
um, to put yourself in alignment with that. And, and when you do that, I tell you what, you feel so much better. I'm not going to guarantee that you're going to win the, you know, win the lottery or something if you mm-hmm. put yourself in alignment. What, but you'll win, you'll win the emotional lottery. You're, you'll win yeah. the spiritual lottery because you're, yeah. you're in alignment with that. The, the challenge that comes with it is that all of a sudden you realize too with with when you're in alignment with that divine love and that divine consciousness all of a sudden you can't lie to yourself anymore <laughs> so you have to be prepared mm. to really look at your life and say you know what that that thing over there doesn't serve me anymore so i'm going to find a different way to mm. you know to live in my life or you know that job doesn't serve me anymore. I need to find something that's more in alignment with who I am in order to feel fulfilled. So mm. with that divine love comes to I call it divine truth. You know, you can't you can't hide from it. You can't hide from yourself either when you put yourself in alignment with that. But but it really makes your life a lot easier to live too. It it takes away a lot of the guesswork and decision making is easy because then you always choose the the choice is to choose the most loving decision whether mm-hmm. that be for yourself or you know others but um yeah aligning with that divine consciousness that divine love is really key uh, i think the key takeaway from all of this it, it's really what underlies all of all of this i think the reason that i've been able to you know, connect with some of those people who are no longer here. And I have other stories, trust me, like, (laughs) um, someday I'll have to just tell you the chicken story, because it's so funny. But there are so many of those instances, but I think it's because I've cultivated that ability to connect to that divine energy, that divine love on a daily basis. And if you can do that, not that not that I'm going out of my way to have these experiences, mm. but but then you're just connected a lot more to everyone and everything. There's that sense of connection and the barriers between you and other people just fall away. They they don't make any sense anymore. Mm. Um, so that's where that you know if you can if you can align yourself with that divine love because it's there. You're a part of it whether yeah. you realize it or not. Mm. Um, it makes your life a lot better. Exactly. Not always easy, but better. I right. love how you put that. Yeah, exactly. It's not always going to be straightforward. But you talked about how if we tap in, then maybe we realize, oh, our job's maybe not quite so right. So we need to look for something new. And it might be little things at a time. Yeah. I love it. Nancy, thank you so much. Thank you for coming and sharing all of your insights, your stories, your little bits of information around after-death communication. There's so much more in there than what we've shared. I know that, but I want to say a huge thank you for what you've shared today. Nancy, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to stay updated with all of the events we have going on and to visit www.letstalkneardeath.com to join the VIP community.